Okay, well, welcome back. Um, I left you with this uh, problem to work on the last time around. And um, we had, you had offset distances. This is a data from a common midpoint gather. So you have offsets that, uh, source receiver offsets from 3 to 36 meters. And then we have these two-way uh, travel times for three reflection events. And then they're displayed over here in the uh, time distance plot. In this time distance plot, we see reflection hyperbola, TX plot. And we can see that the uh, slopes decrease with depth. It, it was really hard to tell whether there was an increase or decrease in slope from um, reflector 2 to reflector 3. But uh, this will turn out to be kind of interesting as we go through the analysis. But the question is, how do we extract the thicknesses of these layers and their velocities uh, from the RMS uh, velocity analysis? So the uh, t squared x squared transformation that we were working with, uh, remember that when we take the um, tx relationship, the hyperbolas, we square the time, we square the distance, that we end up with this linear relationship between time and offset distance. Now, remember that we came up with this relationship uh, very simply when we were talking about uh, some ray trace theory. We have that the time basically is equal to the distance traveled at the total distance here represented as one side of a right triangle over the velocity. And here we're dealing with a single layer case. This would be a V1. And we'd have 2h over V, the quantity squared 2h over v is just your t0. So we have t0 squared plus x squared over v squared. When we square both sides of this relationship here, we get uh, t squared is equal to t0 squared plus x squared over v rms squared. So now, in this particular case, with a single layer problem, the rms velocity is equal to the interval velocity, but only for that case. So T0 is the intercept, and 1 over VRMS squared is the slope. So again, we're assuming that the RMS velocity is a best fit velocity, and it's an approximation of the NMO velocity. So the NMO is approximately equal to VRMS, so that we have uh, an interval velocity relationship for the nth layer, uh, which we derived earlier, last time, in this form. So under this uh, assumption here that uh, t squared is approximately equal to t0 squared plus x squared over vrms squared, with t0 the intercept and 1 over vrms squared the slope, we square the x's, square the t's, so we have our x squared t squared data here, and then we're going to plot this up, and we're going to fit trend lines to each event. And uh, that's probably the easiest way to um, get a quick measurement of the uh, intercept and the uh, uh, slope terms. So uh, this uh, equation here, we'll come back to this when we uh, extract information from our trend lines. Now if we take a look at the trend lines for reflection event 1, 2, and 3. We have these um, we have these uh, t squared x squared trend lines and uh, notice that I've also included the coefficient of determination, the r squared here. You can see that for the first reflector as we as we mentioned the fit is going to be perfect. Uh, the RMS velocity is going to be equal to the uh, actual velocity, the actual interval velocity in this layer. So we have this term, which is the slope, and I've kind of reversed the order uh, here. This is our t0 squared. This is our 1 over vrms squared. So in order to estimate the velocity, we're just simply going to take the uh, square root of the reciprocal of this term, this term, this term, in order to get the rms velocities. Remember, the rms velocities are not the interval velocities. We have to do some additional analysis uh, to, to get that. But but again, the uh, RMS velocities are an approximation of the NMO velocity. 
and we're going to be getting those from the RMS, uh, uh, from the slope term. So the intercepts are just t0 squared, so we just take the square roots of these uh, intercept terms in our trend lines, and then we get our uh, t0. Remember that the times here are in milliseconds, so that's something to factor in when you come up with your velocities, which you may want to express in terms of meters per second. So we go through this analysis. Um, we take a look at the slope here. Uh, we calculate the NMO, RMS velocity. We get NMO velocities of 400, 1349, 1356. We get our T zeros of 0 0.02, 0 0.0622, 0 0.0794. So in this equation, uh, T sub n, this is the delta t between layers n and layers n minus 1. Just, just a reminder when we're calculating the interval velocity for the nth layer. Now what happens in the first layer? What's v n m o n minus 1? If n is equal to 1, this is going to be the interval velocity or the NMO velocity of a layer abo above it, which, you know, we don't have any layers above it. So, this term basically drops out, and we can see immediately that the v1 is just going to be equal to, and t0 is going to be equal to t sub n, is just going to be equal to um, the uh, uh, vnmo. So, slopes to get our nmo velocities, intercepts to get our t0s. Come back to this expression, go through the calculations. Start with layer 1, then move down to layer 2. So this is going to be t sub n. This n is going to be equal to 2, this will be equal to 1. Then you go down to layer 3, this will be 3, this will be 1. Just taking a look at the first term, the velocity, take the reciprocal, Take the square root of the reciprocal of the slope. Turns out to be 0.4 meters per millisecond. We want it in meters per second, or you may want it in meters per second. Turns out to be 400. Okay, so this is the basic uh, data that you came up with from an analysis of the uh, trend lines, uh, the slopes, and the intercepts. Uh, we came up with the NMO VRMS velocities. We came up with the uh, uh, intercept times here, the T zeros. And then again, we're just kind of working our way down from layer 1 to 2 to 3. The interval velocity in the first layer, as we showed, that, that's obviously going to be equal to 400. Then, you know, we go, we, we substitute into that expression, working our way down from the top to the bottom. We come up with a velocity of about 16, uh, 1,615 meters per second, 1,384 meters per second. And as we mentioned earlier on, well, this layer between, uh, this interval between layers, between interfaces two and three, is actually a lower velocity uh, interval by a little over uh, 100 meters, uh, 200 meters per second. The thicknesses, uh, we just calculate using the one-way travel times. We have the velocities. We have the uh, t zeros. These are two-way times, so we take 0.01 times 400. We get 4. And you're going to do the same thing with uh, layers 2 and 3 to get uh, thicknesses of 34.1 and 11.9. <clears throat> so we're just substituting into this expression over here. And then that's going to give us total depths of 4, 38, and 50. So the bottom of our model is going to be around 50 meters. We can see that we have these three layers, and they're plotted in terms of depth versus velocity. So we have uh, our 400 meter, 400 meter per second layer, our 1615, our 1380, if I remember those numbers correctly. And so we've got these three layers, 1, 2, and we were looking at reflections from the interface between layer 1 and 2, the interface between layer 2 and 3, the interface between layer 3 and 4. 
to get our R1, R2, and R3. So we really don't have a velocity for layer 4. If we had amplitude information, we would have known. We could estimate or approximate what the velocity was for layer 4. Also, if we had amplitude information, we would have seen that there would have been a polarity reversal here between uh, at, for the reflection from uh, the interface between layers 2 and layers 3. So amplitude information is very helpful, as we've discussed previously. We just didn't have it here. We're just working with the uh, TX data from a common midpoint gather. So the different forms of move out that we've looked at, we've talked about uh, the normal move out approximation using a Taylor series expansion. This was presented on this video. We discussed the non-hyperbolic nature of move out, and we saw some of that when we looked at the uh, coefficient of determination, the R squareds, for the reflection events from interface two and three. That's discussed in this video. And we also talked about the errors introduced when the correction velocities are too high or too low when we apply. We actually apply the delta T correction using uh, our NMO velocities if, if they're too high or too low. So, uh, <clears throat> And the problem we just worked, we should keep in mind uh, uh, these, you know, the potential for error in estimating our thicknesses, uh, the velocities, and we're assuming this uh, hyperbolic, uh, you know, perfect hyperbola for the t-squared, x-squared analysis. In other words, perfect straight lines, which is not the case, as we, as we saw. Although the differences from linear, linearity were very small in this, in this particular problem. Uh, they're nonetheless something that you have to keep in mind, especially as you go to deeper and deeper uh, uh, intervals, and you have... Um, you know, your, your offset to depth ratio becomes uh, um, much less than one. So the next uh, time we're going to present a brief comparison of the velocities that we've talked about, the RMS velocity, the average velocity, and the NMO velocity. So um, thanks for joining me. Uh, hope you subscribe to the channel and uh, leave comments. I'll try to answer them if, if I can. So. Thanks again.